Not all Imperial defectors are cut from the same cloth. People defect for different reasons, and more importantly for this video during different periods of the Galactic Civil War. Today I want to take a look at how dangerous and difficult it was to defect depending on what time period the Imperial soldier did it. I'll be separating this video into four different periods. First we have the OG stage, which ranges from 19 BBY to 14 BBY. This period literally starts when the Republic falls and the Empire rises. Then we have the Outer Rim Awakening period, which takes place between 14 BBY to 5 BBY. Then finally, we have the Skirmish period of 5 BBY to 0 BBY, followed by the War period, which ranges from 0 BBY to the end of the war. After the Battle of Endor, there was just mass defecation all over the galaxy. It got everywhere, and it was a mess to clean it up. Now, this video will have many different purposes. Um, one of the things I want us to take a look at is just um, how different each Imperial Defector's experience was. And it not only depended on when they did it, but also what the circumstances surrounding their defection was. This video also consequently charts the course of the Galactic Civil War and the many events that will influence which direction things will go. Certain events will increase the ability for people to defect and certain events will make it harder. This is also a really good opportunity to ask yourself, when would you defect if you were in the Empire? Would you do it before the Galactic Civil War even started or would you wait later on until Endor? Or maybe you would just stay on the whole entire time. Now, before we continue, a quick word from our sponsor for today's video, ownersaber.com. This summer, they're giving you guys 40% off of all of their lightsabers and that includes free shipping. This includes the very awesome Maul lightsaber. Yes, this is a replica lightsaber of everyone's favorite Sith assassin turned crime lord. And yes, it's a double bladed lightsaber that can be taken part in the middle for dual wielding purposes. This is Maul's first lightsaber, not to be confused with the janky one he created from an Inquisitor's blade. The Maul comes with RGB blades for both sides, which are super durable and perfect for channeling the chaotic energy of Maul. The lightsaber comes in either two 82 centimeter blades or two 92 centimeter blades. 92 centimeters is basically a yard, so times that by two, it's pretty intimidating if you start swinging that thing around. Anyway guys, if you wanna take a look at that uh, lightsaber, I'll link it down in the description below. Also, you can use our promo code EWOK, that's all caps, for an additional $15 off. Thank you for your patience, on to the rest of the video. Okay, let's start off with the OG generation. This is 19 BBY to 14 BBY. These guys were woke before the word woke became toxic in our own lexicon. The Republic had just turned into the Empire after its glorious defeat of the Separatist Alliance. Tired of war and conflict, most people in the galaxy wanted things to just return back to normal. The Empire still had that new speeder smell and people were willing to sacrifice a little bit of their personal freedom for a lot more security. Surveillance and prosecution without limit. You're doing nothing wrong. What is there to fear? Well, I'm fearing your definition of wrong. These are dangerous times. Dangerous times. Are they not? And because the majority of Imperial personnel were basically clones, there weren't that many defectors in the first place, thanks to the power of the inhibitor chips and other genetic modifications made to the clones. But some clones had been nurtured and taught important lessons by their Jedi Masters on how one should treat other people and how one should live their life. All platoons have reported in, General. Get some rest. Thank you, sir. I'm fine. The General's giving you an order, Dogma. Of course, sir! He's wound tight, but uh, he's loyal. <laughs> he kind of reminds me of you. Maybe back in the day. It was the clones who the Jedi spent the most time training and talking to who would first exhibit signs of individualism and begin to really question the motives of the Empire. Some clones like Captain Rex defected immediately after snapping out of the spell of the inhibitor chips after Order 66, thanks to his Arcatano's quick actions. Then you had individuals like Clone Commando Gregor who tried to escape his post. He had been assigned to a secret facility on the planet of Dero where he was training the future TK Trooper program. Gregor was always a quirky individual. I blame it on too many explosions. Head trauma is a serious thing. And despite that, he still immediately recognized that this new empire and its TK troopers were not his cup of tea. Commander Cody took a little while longer than others to realize that he'd been fighting for the wrong side, but as someone who was mentored by Obi-Wan Kenobi, I think he eventually figured it out. 
Obi-Wan Kenobi was all about, you know, institutions and following the orders, but he usually had a solid moral compass and knew what was right or wrong. And I believe Cody going AWOL was one of the major reasons why mutated clone Crosshair would eventually turn against the Empire as well. Lieutenant. It took Crosshair a bit longer to wake up than the rest of his unit, the Bad Batch. They had defected much earlier on because it would be impossible for them to continue being who they are within the Empire. I mean, it was already tough for them to exist in the Republic amongst other clones. Then you had individuals like Captain Hauser. He was a veteran of the lengthy Republic campaign on the world of Ryloth. He had a great deal of respect for the local people and its resistance leader, General Tram Sandula. When the Republic turned into the Empire, Hauser tried his best to serve as an honest intermediary between the Empire and the Twilight people. But when he realized that the Empire's true intentions with the planet were to exploit its people and resources, he would risk his career and life to protect Tram Sandula's family and help them escape capture. As if that weren't heroic enough, Hauser doesn't flee with the Sindulas because he refuses to abandon his men. He goes back and tries to convince several of them to escape with him instead. These clones were really the first Imperial defectors, and they, you know, defected for a variety of different reasons, but most of them were driven by a deep moral conviction that made it impossible for them to stay was in the Empire. It also should be noted that Captain Rex would become one of the main organizers of an underground that would help clones escape from their servitude. There were also non-clone personnel serving in the Grand Army of the Republic. They were either administrators or they were you know, officers. Some of these individuals like Wolf Yularen already had a more authoritarian and security focused mindset and naturally fit within the new order without much issue. Others though, like Commandant Pal Bailo, were diehard Republicans. He was in charge of the Defiance Flight Training Institute and he tried to plunge his training vessel into the sun when Vader and Emperor Palpatine came for a visit. That's pretty hardcore. But far more important were the individuals who could bring their skills and experience to the Rebel Alliance. Well, it wasn't called Rebel Alliance back then. There was no alliance, it was just a bunch of different insurgency groups. Jan Dodonna had been a bridge officer aboard the Venator-class Star Destroyer during the Clone Wars and was one of the first people to captain an Imperial-class Star Destroyer. He became disillusioned with the Empire's methods pretty early on and would defect the Rebellion. He would quickly join the Alliance High Command and develop the Rebel Navy's doctrine. He would eventually become head of the Masasi Group, one of the largest fleets fielded by the early Rebellion. Then he had guys like Crix Medin, a former Imperial Commando. He would help set up the Rebel Alliance Special Forces and help them plan many daring raids against against the Empire. Davids Dravins was an accomplished intelligence operative for the Galactic Republic's military intelligence service. He would defect to the Alliance to restore the Republic before its formal creation in order to prevent the Empire from continuing to grow. While the clones who defected during this period of time were very heroic, the Imperial officers who defected with all of their knowledge and experience would go on to build the foundations for the movement that would one day become the Rebel Alliance. Without their sacrifice, all of this would have been meaningless. Now by 14 BBY, or five years after the Republic had fallen, Emperor Palpatine had more or less finished reshaping the Imperial military. The Venator-class Star Destroyers were completely replaced by Imperial-class Star Destroyers. The V-Wings had been completely replaced by the TIE Fighters, and of course, the clones had been completely replaced by TK Troopers, and finally, the Stormtroopers. Five years of continuous military expansion cost a lot of resources. Palpatine had nationalized the banking system and many industries and even entire planets full of resources. But still, that wasn't enough to continue funding this massive military. Plus, the market economy still existed to a certain extent. Laborers cost money, even if the Empire became one of the only employers in town. And so the Empire turned its head towards the Outer Rim, as many former governments did, and it sought out cheap labor and cheap resources. Tucked outside of the, quote, civilized parts of the galaxy, what happened out here stayed out here. It was a lawless hellscape. This is why the Empire would build the Death Star near the Outer Rim planet of Geonosis and hide its plan on the archives on the Outer Rim planet of Scarif. The Outer Rim also happened to be a place where the Empire could purchase slaves from the Zygerians or Trandoshans. Now, some worlds like Jalukan actually experienced some immediate benefits. I mean, most worlds kind of did if they didn't resist the Empire. This included the industrialization of their planet, which created a lot of jobs. Um, the Empire also brought their Imperial Academy system, which was good for educational purposes. But within a few years, the entire planet was polluted and covered in smog. The same thing would happen to the world of Lothal, which had rich deposits of dunium beneath its surface. Within a few years of Imperial occupation, the grasslands of Lothal were razed to the ground. 
All of this happened out of sight of Coruscant and out of sight of the Imperial Senate. Well, most of the senators were just doing whatever Emperor Palpatine wanted to do anyway by this point. And those who were opposed to Emperor Palpatine were so powerless that no one even bothered to lock them up. They were just treated as a joke. And it will prove that this is a boot to the throats of all Gormans who've done nothing more than request their basic rights. But for the locals living in the Outer Rim, I mean, the situation got tougher and tougher by the minutes. And of course, the Empire saw a golden opportunity to turn dissidents into slave labor. Cassian Andor, who had entered the Imperial penal system after assaulting a group of clones on Ferrix, became a cook for the Imperial Army during the Mimbam campaign. As would Han Solo, who would be assigned to the Imperial Army after having disciplinary issues in the Imperial Navy. Both would go AWOL eventually, but wouldn't join the rebellion until later on. But the seeds of dissent had been planted. You also had individuals like Tala Durth. She was an Imperial officer and she was actually ordered to round people together on the planet of Durth who had not paid their taxes and basically execute them. She would be haunted by her actions and would join the Hidden Path, an underground railroad built to ferry Force sensitives away from the Imperial dominated core to the Outer Rim where they had safe houses. Now I tend to look at situations like this, like the one Tala Durf went under, uh, as not only just evil, but a sign of imperial incompetence. I mean, how do you get to the point where a good percentage of your uh, population aren't paying taxes? And perhaps someone studied whether such tax rates were sustainable in the Outer Rim, or perhaps it was just that the Empire provided so little services in the Outer Rim that no one wanted to pay up in the first place. The mistakes that led to this incident were planted long ago when they first set up the tax system in this area. And now you couldn't use policy or regulations to kind of solve the situation. You couldn't use bureaucracy or diplomacy. You could just only use your military, which is terrible at handling these kind of situations. And the more Imperial soldiers were used to kill and murder their own people, the more these soldiers would begin to defect. You know, just because they look like robots, because they wear those helmets, doesn't mean that they don't have a heart and soul. It doesn't mean that they don't spend, you know, 10 minutes every morning looking at feel-good stories on Instagram and just crying softly by themselves while they're enjoying their morning coffee. You had guys like Tarman Burkona, a stormtrooper who left the core. This was relatively unheard of, especially before the Battle of Endor. Stormtroopers were selected for their ideological purity and loyalty to the Empire. But I guess anyone with half a brain could figure out that the Empire's promise of bringing peace and stability to the galaxy was actually a lie. Other soldiers like Lieutenant Gorn, second command of the Aldani garrison, fell for a local and their culture. She would be killed by the Empire, unfortunately, causing him to flip sides and become a spy for the Rebel Alliance. Without Lieutenant Gorn, the Aldani heist would have never happened. No matter how much the Empire tried, it couldn't turn their army into a droid army. There was just too much individuality amongst the rank and file. And now the Empire was stuck in a cycle of incompetence, which led to brutality, which led to more defection, which led back to more brutality. The whole system was never designed to last more than a few decades. I mean, the Empire had to make a choice here. It had to either embrace this culture of death, destruction, and massacring people for no reason, and getting rid of anyone who opposed that, or they could just ignore these events and pretend like they never happened and suppress uh, news about these massacres that were being carried out. Now, if the Empire chooses the former, it will invite all sorts of psychopaths and criminals into their organization. And let me tell you, the only thing that separates a violent mob from a military unit is that discipline and a conscious decision to protect life as much as possible. This is something that goes increasingly difficult as the situation on the battlefield becomes more and more dangerous. Not all defectors from the Empire were military, some were like Lonnie Jung, a supervisor in the Imperial Security Bureau. He would provide priceless information to Luthen Rael and his rebel spy network. Given the role the ISB would soon take in the Empire, individuals like Lonnie would keep the rebellion safe. And in many ways, he was in more danger than anyone else because everyone around him was trained to root out traitors like him. So the Aldani raid represented one of the most embarrassing and visible attacks on the Empire, at least before the Galactic Civil War starts in earnest. The Aldani team had gotten away with a portion of an entire sector's worth of payroll. They had proven that the Imperial Army was not only incapable of defending itself from such raids, but it also had severe loyalty issues amongst its ranks, even at the officer level. And so the Public Order Resentencing Directive was carried out by Palpatine. And while a lot of people focus on the increase in punitive measures, what's important to look at here is the almost unlimited power the Imperial Security Bureau was given. They superseded military command and in a way answered directly through their own chain of command to Palpatine because they technically were a civilian organization. 
This is really Palpatine's quick fix. The Imperial military was poorly built to handle an insurgency amongst its own ranks, and the ISB basically became his eyes, ears, and fist. But by this time, it was already too late. The insurgency had dug its roots deep. A decade of pilfering the Outer Rim had created legions upon legions of people ready to join an insurgency. Cassian Andor and Han Solo, as we talked about before, would join the Rebellion, as would younger kids like Sabi and Ren, a Mandalorian who defected from the Imperial Academy system. In the years leading up to the Battle of Yavin, the Empire would tighten its grip on worlds like Lothal, which basically turned the entire planet against the small garrison that was placed there. The Empire, even with their massive fleets and legions of stormtroopers, were never going to outnumber the local populace they were guarding. As rebels and Imperials started mixing more and more, there was more access between the two groups. It became easier for Imperials to defect. Agent Callus, an ISB officer assigned to the Lothal sector, would crash land on a frozen planet alongside a rebel fighter known as Zeb Aurelius. Agent Callus had hurt his leg during the landing and Zeb would actually protect him and together they would work to survive and escape their situation. It was this connection that Callus made with Zeb that would make him realize just how meaningless and cold the Empire was as an institution. Especially during this period of time, the organization had gone increasingly paranoid about traitors amongst its ranks, and at the officer level, everyone was just backstabbing each other for more power. And the good Imperial officers that were still left, well, they were either killed in line of duty, or jailed, or they just simply left. The culture of the Empire was turning sour, and there was very little that good Imperial officers could do to stop that tide. And so defection became more and more popular. Wedge and Tilly's realized as a cadet in Sky Strike Academy that the Empire wasn't really the place for him. His instructors were teaching the pilots how to disobey Imperial protocol and shoot down unarmed civilian ships. He and a few of his fellow cadets would defect as well. Generally speaking, Imperial pilots and basically Imperial Navy personnel had a better chance of escaping than Imperial Army personnel, and that was because they were flying ships. Galen Erso, the Imperial scientist who built a major flaw in the Death Star, used Imperial transport pilot buddy Rook to deliver his message to the Rebellion. This ultimately led to the raid on Scarif and the theft of the Death Star plans, which were followed by the destruction of Alderaan. Now, Alderaan was a game changer. The destruction of this planet couldn't be easily hidden. Not everyone knew exactly what happened, but they knew that Alderaan was now gone. Alderaan officer, like Nash Windrider, was on the Death Star as it happened. He watched in horror and confusion as his homeworld and his people were sentenced to death for being traitors. Nash would eventually recover from his shock, but because he's lost everything and the only thing he has left was the Empire, he would actually double down on being more loyal and fanatic to the Empire. It's kind of sad to see. Even loyal Imperial diehards like CNRE found it hard to swallow the Empire's actions after Alderaan. She had hailed from that planet of Jellucon, as we talked about before, and she had been given many opportunities that she would have never had otherwise. She had been living a pretty primitive existence before the Empire had set up the Imperial Academy on her planets. Others from her planet, like Thane Kyrell, who came from a wealthier background, was disgusted by the destruction of Alderaan and would defect after the Death Star was destroyed. Now, after the Battle of Yavin, rebel recruitment grew massively, as now it was clear that the Empire could be hurt. I think a lot of Imperial soldiers defected during this period of time because they already had this idea in their head, but they weren't sure if the Rebel Alliance would actually, you know, coalesce into a serious force. There were also plenty of silent Imperials sitting and watching their compatriots commit heinous acts of cruelty. And as things began to grow more and more desperate for the Empire, and as the Rebels began to take more ground, Imperials actually started to defect out of fear and hopelessness. Every Chalice Governor of Hyderabad Prime was one of these individuals. Her world was swept up in the mid-rim offensive, and she knew she would be blamed for the fall of her planet, and so she would defect to the rebel infantry unit that took over her planet. She would provide uh, priceless information on Imperial logistics. By the time the Battle of Endor had started, more and more Imperials were joining the ranks of the Rebellion, and instead of being suspicious of their motives, Mon Mothma, for better or worse, kept an open-door policy. No judgment, no punishment, especially for the enlisted and junior officers. Uh, the New Republic, as it was called at this point, wanted to end the war as soon as possible, and this meant encouraging as many Imperials to give up as possible. You also had units like Alphabet Squadron, made up of former Imperial pilots like Erica Quell and Nath Tencent. They were assigned specifically to hunt down Quell's former unit, the Feared Shadow Wing, one of the units responsible for Operation Cinder. This was the Emperor's last vindictive order, the destruction of Imperial worlds, because the Empire had failed him. 
When Ida Versio, the daughter of a powerful ISB admiral and leader of the Special Forces Unit Inferno Squad, was ordered to help aid in the destruction of her own homeworld, she also defected. So there you have it guys, four very different periods for Imperials to defect. Let me know in the comment section below which group you would have belonged to or would you have just stayed with the Empire until the bitter end because that's kind of your thing. Well guys, I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification button down below so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. As usual, my name is Alan reminding you that my allegiance is to the Republic, to democracy.